Hi, everybody. This is Maxine Taylor with another edition of Move Into the Magic. And my guest once again is the brilliant Dr. Rocco Errico. He is the founder of the Nura Foundation in Smyrna, Georgia. And you can contact him at his website, www. And I'm going to spell this for you. N O O H R A dot com. Now, I'm going to let his words speak for him for themselves because as we are recording this, it is one hour before Donald Trump is going to be inaugurated as president of the United States. And I thought it was incredibly appropriate that Rocco talked to us this week about leadership, power, and control in the Bible, what the Bible says about leadership, power, and control. Rocco, welcome back. Thank you, Maxine. This is a wonderful opportunity because the scriptures say a lot about leadership and what kind of leadership, and it talks about power, talks about control. First of all, just to simplify it, before we talk about it in the sense of leadership, I always used to say that most of us suffer from a drug called PCP. <laughs> and we're all addicted to it. <laughs> I mean, not just anyone in leadership, but we're all addicted to it. And the PCP, of course, most people can think about the angel dust that it used to be called. But I'm going to tell you what I say to the PCP. Power, control, and perfection. And I'm not going to talk about perfection, but power and control. Most of us go for that idea. We, we want to control everything. We want to control our bodies. We want to control, control, control. You see, and that's the mistake. That's a mistake. Control is a big mistake. It's not controlling. The secret to not control is learning to work with and not control. So that's the only antidote for control. Learn to work with. You see, we try to control our enemies, try to control you know, people and even in families, you know, heads of families tried to control everyone in the family. It doesn't work. You have to learn to work with people. And, you know, we're getting to some of the qualities of real leadership is. Yes. What do the scriptures say about leadership? Hmm? Okay. Well, you know, one other thought before I really get into that. One other thing. What feeds control? power. The more power you have, the more likely you're to slip into control and wanting to control. Yeah. I like the word power in Aramaic, what it means. The word for power in Aramaic is <clears throat> hyla, some pronounce it hela, which means something that animates you, moves you, it's an energy. Power is really an energy. But when we think of power, we think of might, strength. <clears throat> That's what we think of. But the real word, the meaning of it in the Semitic languages, and especially Aramaic, because I always approach everything from Aramaic, and that was the language of Jesus and the language of the Hebrew patriarchs. So, it is the ability to work with something, and that is the true meaning of power. In other words, I, am, I have the energy to work with something. For instance, when, when people try to lose weight and stuff like that, they try to control it, and they can't do that. Right. You have to learn to work with your body, and everyone is uniquely different with the body. Okay, that's enough on that. Let's get back to the leadership. I just wanted to give people a different picture of using those two words, power and control. What do the scriptures say about leadership? 
what kind of leadership? If you notice in scripture, real chosen leaders had a particular occupation. Now, ancient Israel, the, the basic thing in ancient Israel was agriculture. That's what kept them going, was agriculture. But there was a secondary type of occupation, and that was livestock, such as sheep and goats. You find out more about you find more about sheep and goats than you do about cows. They do have they did have them, but it's more sheep and goats. So if you follow the stories in scripture, in what we call the Hebrew Bible, if you follow the stories in there, you discover that a great deal of leadership came from being a shepherd. The most outstanding form of leadership was a man or a woman who could shepherd sheep. This is a unique, let me tell you about this. This is a unique occupation because you had to do two things. There would do actually two types of shepherds. One we call the chief shepherd, the chief shepherd. And then the underlings, those under the chief shepherds, they were shepherds too, but they were under the chief shepherd. The chief, to be the chief shepherd, now we're talking about real leadership here now. It means you took all flocks, all flocks, flocks that didn't belong to you. And they had to learn the names of every single sheep. They took care of the sheep. The, the chief shepherd had to know how to lead. He never drove the sheep. He always led the sheep out front. I never forget when I was in Lebanon and we were downtown Lebanon. This is 1965 when I was in downtown Lebanon and I couldn't believe my eyes. There was all traffic stop. Everything had to stop. All four sections where the intersection came in all four, everyone had to stop, all cars, all buses, everything stopped. Why? Because there was a shepherd leading his sheep, huge flock of sheep, through the downtown section of Beirut. And everyone stopped. And there was the shepherd. He was out in front. That's what he was doing. He was looking out this way for, to protect his sheep. And the sheep were all huddled together following that shepherd. He was a true leader. And he had a rod and a staff. Most people don't even know what that stands for. The staff stands for protection. Protection. To protect the sheep. That's, that's the staff. The rod was for discipline. Not the older sheep, but the younger sheep who wanted to go off. And he used to wrap them on the head with that small rod to get them to come back in line. But the, and, the, and from when they're lambs, they learn to watch where the shepherd is going. And he knows each one by name. One of the major things in being a shepherd is you have to treat all sheep alike. What I mean is, not just your flock, not just those who know you. You see, because the chief shepherd has his own sheep there too. And they know him very well. Even Jesus referred to this when you're reading the Gospels. He says, my sheep know my voice. That meant his flock, see. And, and when they hear his voice, they all come running. But the chief shepherd has to know all the sheep. He must be cognizant of the needs, of the cries, and the yearnings of all the other flocks that do not belong to him. Number one, 
that's a quality in leadership. To really lead people, you've got to know all the flocks, <laughs> including the flock that is not your sheep. Hmm? So there's a big difference there. You see why? And let me tell you something. Moses was a, he was in Egypt. He learned to have power. He learned what it is. He saw what power did. He saw how the people were being treated. Moses saw all of that. So what did he decide to do? He decided to be combative and fight. And see, what the Bible is teaching us here is you can't fight. You've got to learn something else. Well, he murdered. Talking about Moses. He murdered. And he had to flee. Had to flee Egypt. And what did he do? He went to Midian. And in Midian, he married a woman, a Midianite woman, and her name was Zipporah. And his father-in-law was Jethro. That's not his name. That is a title, meaning your excellency. Jethro is not his name. It means reverend or your excellency. And what, did, what job did he get? Here he was, this big shot in Egypt. <laughs> he flees because he used might and power in the sense of strength, combative. Instead, he learns in Midian to take care of sheep. And it's when he was on the mountainside in the hot of the, in the very heat of the afternoon, very hot, and the sheep even huddle to get in places where it's cool and there's some shade. And he was napping. And that's when he opened up spiritually for guidance to know how to go back to Egypt and lead his people. Leadership. He had to learn what it was to be a shepherd first before he could lead people. You understand what I'm saying here? Absolutely, absolutely. And it, this, this is it. In other words, he had to be humble. Yes. Or humility. One of the strong, outstanding characteristics of true leadership is genuine humility. Genuine humility. That is in true leadership. Why? Because through humility, you create a bond and empathy with the people. When you're always smacking them and then saying, oh, you were good afterwards, that's sick. There's something wrong with the character when you do that. One minute, you knock them up, and next minute, straighten them up. Oh, you're so sweet. You're nice. Hmm? That's not true leadership. It's humility that's going to lead. And you can't hide that in a person. You can for a while, but if it's basic in them, I'm talking about this might and combativeness. When you have that combativeness, it's always going to be there. I don't care how you cover it up and how conciliatory you become, it will eventually come out. Humility is one of the major things in true leadership. Hmm? And shepherding was that. And David was a shepherd before he became king. It, it, you you trace it all. And Jesus took care of sheep. That's why he talked about sheep so much. Hmm? He wasn't into agriculture. And he wasn't a carpenter. Everyone makes Jesus out a carpenter. He wasn't a carpenter. And I don't have time to go into that in the biblical episode about that. But even now, there, in Aramaic, it makes it very clear. He was the son of carpenter. It doesn't mean what it means for a carpenter today. You have to understand, understand what it meant in the ancient Near East. But I don't want to get into that. The, the thing I want to see is that Jesus definitely was a shepherd first. And he knew he created empathy with people. Hmm? And that's how he knew how to lead them. And when his disciples would take over, the major thing he taught them was meekness. And the greatest one among them should be servant of all. 
This is a new type of leadership. That's why he rode into Jerusalem on a colt, hmm? on a donkey, but not even on a, a mature donkey, but on a baby. And the mother had to watch out in front so the baby would follow the mother. He purposely did that because he was showing the world, here is true leadership. Hmm? He wasn't riding in on a white horse. He wasn't even riding in on something spectacular. Hmm? But he was showing humility. This is what real pastoring is. A shepherd, a leader, is to be a real pastor. But to pastor a nation, oh, that is quite a job. I wouldn't have it for a million bucks. <laughs> no way. Because I pastored in churches, and I know what it's like to pastoring people. This one doesn't like this. This one doesn't. And you go through all, and then committees, and then fighting in committees and all. Can you imagine what it is to lead a world, a nation that is? Mm. Too much. But the scriptures do show. But if there's, hum if there's meekness, if there's humility, then you have the true power, meaning the energy to lead. You'll find a way. You'll see the way. And you don't have to worry about trying to protect yourself. You think about your sheep. So true leadership is built on service to others, humility, meekness, and that energy to connect. Connect. You must connect just as a shepherd connects with the sheep. Hitler, I'm talking about Hitler here. Hitler said, compassion was weakness. When you have compassion, you are weak. This is what he taught. This came out of his own mouth. Compassion is weakness. And he felt the only way, because he had this idea of an Aryan nation. Hmm? Mm -hmm. And he believed that any time people showed compassion, it showed weakness. Mm. And you know what? We don't want compassion in leaders. I got news for you. We don't. We want people to be strong to be combative, hmm? and that's not the true way. And until we learn that, we still think might and strength, and when we mean by strength is that combativeness, is the answer. And this is why pff, people laughed at, at Jesus and his followers. To turn the other cheek, oh, I'll give you the other fist, <laughs> not the other cheek. This is all expressions. It doesn't literally mean lie down and let people walk all over you. Yeah. But it means to have this attitude where you look for something in your enemy where you can bring them in rather than fight them. Hmm? And when someone says something negative about you, you know, yeah. how instead of, hmm, but you know, getting angry and stuff like that, and pfft, vomiting out all these words. You can understand, why did they say that? How come they said that? How can I win them over? Not, how can I push them out farther? Mm -hmm. hmm? We look, real leadership is in character of person, character of being. It doesn't mean you're always going to do the smart move. Yeah. But it's in character that true leadership is. And that's what the scriptures teach. And Jesus taught that with his disciples. Mm. We have the opposite in churches. We do not see even in churches true leadership. Mm. That's supposed to be Christianity. Mm. And the word Christianity, it, it, I call it churchianity. Because churchianity, there is power. There's levels of power. All of that. but 
the real meaning of it, you know, I love the word church in Aramaic. It means literally it comes from the root word meaning to be festive, to throw a party, <laughs> to celebrate, celebrate. And the Christhood, the real meaning of Christ means anointing, to be anointed. Anointed means to be enlightened. See, not that you understand all mysteries and can answer all problems, but you're enlightened enough to know that you are a human being and the people you are leading are human beings. And I'm not just talking about government. I'm talking about in everything. I'm talking about as a teacher, as a pastor, as a minister, as in all these groups. If you're a head of a business, hmm, it's character, not just the smarts here. See, when money becomes the goal, you lose character. You lose the real meaning of character. And you'll start to develop things that you learn to step on people to, to go higher rather than learning to work with it. So this is what scriptures teach. And this is why even in the scriptures, it refers to God as the great shepherd. Hmm? Because just think, when we think of God, we think of, oh, God's controlling. No, God doesn't control. <laughs> if God was controlling, we wouldn't have any of the things we have today. We wouldn't have violence. We wouldn't have murder. We wouldn't have stealing. We, I'm talking about if God was, you understand what I mean, controlling. And God is not controlling. <laughs> he set everything on its own course, including human beings. We have the power to stop murder, to stop control. God is truly the chief shepherd. You know, I translated the 23rd Psalm from Aramaic. And I'm going to read it. It's a little different. Most people are used to hearing this is a famous psalm. Everyone knows it, regardless of what faith you're in. And, you know, the Lord is my shepherd, and I shall not want. I'm going to, I'm going to give you, this is from my book, And There Was Light. And I'm going to read my translation of it, which reads a little differently. So you're going to have to hang on every word. And I wish I had time to talk on it. Maybe sometime we can do that. Let's do it. And it says here, because it has so much depth of meaning. Now, also think of this in leadership, too. The Lord shepherds me. That word shepherd means to nourish, to guide, guidance. The Lord shepherds me, and I lack nothing at all. Because I'm being guided, nourished, so I lack nothing at all. And in pastures of strength, he makes me dwell. It also can mean to lie down. To dwell means that's where you're living, in pastures of strength. He guides me by restful waters. It means waters that the shepherd has pooled so the sheep can drink it. If it's moving too fast, they can't drink it. <laughs> he has restored my life. And upon pathways of justice, he leads me. Here's true leadership. On pathways of justice. Justice means balance. He leads me. Because of your name, meaning your reputation. Even if I walk through the valleys of the shadows of death, I fear no danger. Because you are with me, your rod and your staff have comforted me. You have set tables before me in the sight of my enemies, which is an Aramaic way of speaking, meaning you made me prosper in the sight of my enemies. You have anointed my head with oil. My cup gives joy like pure wine. Your loving kindness and your compassion have pursued me 
actually dogged me <laughs> all the days of my life. And I will live in the house of the Lord, this chief shepherd, for the rest of my days. Isn't that beautiful? That is magnificent. And I thank you so much for ending our session today with your beautiful translation. There are no words to thank you, but I'm going to say it anyhow. Thank you, Rocco. Thank you, Maxine. It was a pleasure being with you, always. Always, always with you. And I hope that you have enjoyed this, everybody, and that you'll join me again next time because I'm going to have Dr. Rocco Erico back um, often. I always do. He is a light on our path. And so, dear friends, I hope you'll join me next time when once again, together, we move into the magic. Till then, remember, when you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. Bye for now.